Hi, everyone. I'm Sun Yin Shang. I'm the Executive Director for the Fuqua Coach K Center on Leadership and Ethics. And this is Cole's Leading Through Challenges Conversations. This session is done in partnership with Duke's Business Oriented Woman, Duke Student Affairs, Fuqua School Businesses, Office of Community and Inclusion, the Duke Masters in Engineering Program, and the Baldwin Scholars. And it's my great joy to introduce you to your moderator tonight, Nancer Lee. Nancer is one of our distinguished undergraduate scholars at the Fuqua Coach K Center on Leadership and Ethics. He is a junior and Oh, actually, he just graduated. He, he, he just finished his junior year, so yeah. he's technically a senior now. <laughs> and yes. he also leads the Chronicles Business Office. So, Lancer, over to you. Thank you, Sanyang. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It is our great honor to be welcoming Mrs. Lisa Borders tonight. Uh, Mrs. Borders prefers to be introduced as a Dukey, not just a 1979 Duke grad. She's also a trustee of our university. She character, characterizes herself as, and I quote, a corporate athlete, primarily you know, working in and making her accomplishments in three sectors. One's public, working in the Atlanta City Council. Two's private, with Time's Up, WNBA, and the Coca-Cola Company. Three is nonprofit, with Grady Health Foundation and the Coca-Cola Foundation. Given her tremendous experience navigating these challenging sectors, we are beyond excited to hear her insights today. Without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic to Mrs. Borders. Thank you for taking your time and sharing your wisdom with us. Oh, Lancer, thank you so much for such a gracious introduction. And Sanyan, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this event tonight. And let me thank all of you who are tuning in virtually from all different parts of the country and arguably all different parts of the world, since we know Lancer is in China. Folks are right. wherever they are, but you could be doing anything. You choose to be here with us tonight, so let me just thank you for that. Let me jump in and uh, make a couple of comments. I don't know that I wanna talk 15 minutes because I wanna leave most of the time for Q&A for you all. These are historic and very unique times, so I really wanna give good latitude for you guys to ask any questions that you wanna ask, but let me do some setups for you if that's okay. So I wanna talk about three concepts. I wanna talk about your mindset, your model, and then your mastery. In terms of mindset, I had a couple of points when I sent these topics over to Lancer, and I said I wanted to talk about being proactive or being reactive. And what I would tell you is that my preference is to be proactive. Oftentimes that's not possible when things hit you out of the blue that you don't see coming. We all have to react in some way. But here's what I would offer. Rather than react, let's think about responding. Reaction oftentimes is filled with emotion and it's immediate. And so whatever you're doing in that immediate moment you haven't had time to process, digest, and then come out with the answer that you think is best. So what I would invite you and encourage you to do is respond rather than react. Respond means that you have in fact had time to hear the problem, see the problem, experience the challenge, digest it, draw from your academic or your life experience or any other exposure that you've had and shape your answer or your response by virtue of all of those inputs. Some of them might be qualitative, some of them might be quantitative, but there are in fact data points that you can apply to whatever the given situation is. So that's worst case scenario when you're having to respond. The best case scenario is being able to be proactive. And oftentimes that comes with also being preemptive. Meaning if you can prepare for a situation, you can actually position yourself or your organization or your class or your business for whatever is coming over the transom. So in the case of COVID, none of us, particularly saw that coming on this call. 
But there were scientists who predicted five and seven years ago that this might be a problem, that there might be a pandemic, a healthcare crisis. A pandemic, by definition, covers multiple continents. So when you have something that is striking North America, South America, Asia, that's a pandemic by definition. And so we didn't see it coming as individual lay people, but there were those who saw it coming and who raised the flag and said, we need to prepare. If you think back to the Ebola crisis during the Obama administration, we didn't see that coming either, but people worked on it and they put a process in place and an office in place to address not only Ebola, but what might come after Ebola that had the similar attributes of being a pandemic that was a threat to not only America, but to the globe. Now, that was being proactive and in fact preemptive. We saw it coming potentially again. We put an agency in place to work on that. Unfortunately, that office was dismantled in recent years, in the last two, two and a half years. So we find ourselves having to respond now, and it really was react, because by the time that our country realized what was going on on mass, the COVID crisis was upon us. And Seattle and New York and some places in California were already inundated with community spread. So that's a perfect illustration of we had an opportunity to prepare. We did, but then we were not consistent in our preparation. So I would offer that being proactive is always best, but even if you cannot be proactive, be responsive rather than reactive. So that's mindset. Be positive, be proactive. That's the first lesson. The second would be model. How are you going to act every day? And how are you going to act in a crisis? What I often tell people is a crisis doesn't make us act any differently. It actually reveals who we are as people fundamentally. So when things are going well, no one needs any help with how to behave. When things are going haywire, that's when we all seem to need support. So I encourage people to think about your behavior every day and try to prepare for the crisis so you can avoid making decisions and acting inappropriately during a crisis. You all are Duke family. You're Duke MBAs, you're alums, you're interns, you're smart people. You are leaders, and so people are going to look to you for the tenor and tone of your behavior in a crisis. They're always going to look to you when things are going well, but you want them to look at you in a positive way when things are not going well. That means you have got to be in a mental place, a physical, and an emotional place that says you are steady. Because if you are not calm, the energy that you are going to send out will be frenetic. And people in your class, in your family, in your company, they're going to feel that energy. And you know, and I know, that when you are calm, you do your best thinking. When you are angry or you are feeling frenetic or scared or nervous, how do you behave? You're like, oh my God, I need help. Okay, don't do that. Even if you need the help, you can ask for that calmly because that energy level that you push out, that's what you're going to give out and that's what's going to come back at you. You want to make sure that everyone stays calm in the crisis. It doesn't mean everything's going to be perfect. So that brings me to big bets. Your behavior will guide your decision making because you will be able to make clear, decisive decisions while you're in the crisis, provided you have the right mindset. But then you need a plan. You can't go 50 different directions. Sin Tzu tells us you cannot fight a battle on multiple fronts. When you're in the war, one front 
at a time. So you need to make some big bets. Where are you going to focus your greatest energy? And which direction will you point your colleagues, your friends, your classmates, your family? What is it that you think will be the biggest bang for the buck in this given crisis? Today, Dr. Fauci, who everybody, perhaps no one knew his name five years ago, everyone seems to know that guy's name. I think Coach K called him America's point guard. I have a crush on Dr. Fauci. I think he's 78 years old, and I have a crush on that guy because he's so smart and he's so calm. No matter what he's telling us, he never raises his voice, he never screams and yells. He doesn't swear, he just gives it to you straight. No chaser, but he's very, very calm when he does it. His big bets have been on facial coverings to stop the transmission of the COVID virus, social distancing, and staying home, right? So we are not having large collections of people and giving the virus fertile area to grow and to move across our country. So he made some very clear big bets. Those of us who couldn't spell social distancing, we all know what it is today and we all understand what it is. And a whole new industry, a cottage industry of fashion and function has started with the different color masks and those with HEPA filters and those with blue devil insignias on them. We are now recognizing that we have a new way of life potentially, and now we're trying to make it cool. But it was Dr. Fauci and the task force and the scientists who made a decision that these were the big bets, not just for them individually, but for us collectively. So lesson number two, keep a cool head when things are crazy. You've got to position yourself that you understand who you are and whose you are, and that you have a responsibility to lead, which means folks are going to be looking at you to see how you're going to handle whatever it is that came at you and at us. Decide where you're going to focus your energy. It's on your people first, always. You've got to communicate with them clearly, but you've got to understand what you're going to tell them to do and be able to articulate it in a consistent, clear, and crisp fashion. So your big bets have got to be made in your own mind before you share them with everyone else. And then finally, mastery. I said I would talk about opportunities and obstacles. We all know when opportunities knock, we look around and see, are we ready to go running through the door when it opens and there's a big chance for us to get a new job or find a new girlfriend or a new boy? Then that opportunity presents itself. We're like, woohoo, this is fantastic. When we see obstacles, we are less enthusiastic. In fact, we sometimes get nervous about obstacles. Let me tell you about obstacles. Obstacles are not there to punish you. They're there to push and promote you. Remember this, diamonds are made under pressure. Diamonds don't just sit there and birth themselves. They are made under extreme pressure. When you exercise, your muscles actually shred themselves and grow back together stronger. That's pressure from you exerting those muscles. So obstacles, in my view, are very good for us. They really push us to do better and be better. And anytime I have found myself in a situation where I was uncomfortable, I often remember something my mother used to tell me when I was fearful as a little girl, and Sanyan has heard me say this many, many times, that my mother said, fear stands for false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. That issue, whatever it is that you think is too hard or you can't overcome, is in your head. Everything you need to do well 
is already in you. You have to believe that you have not only the capacity, but the capability to overcome that obstacle and use it to your advantage. So I invite you to do the Snoopy dance when you have opportunities, but also do the Snoopy dance when you have obstacles and understand that they, in fact, will help you more to become the person that you want to be. So let me stop there. Lancer, I'm not sure how much time I used, but I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing the three lessons that I found it super helpful for. It's very, it, it aligns with the current situation and gives us some very tangible steps to, to look ahead and see how, what we can do to respond to the challenges and uncertainties. We do have some questions popping up, but just to get us oh. started. Okay. Um, under the challenging circumstances as we see now, given yeah. your experiences as leaders in various organizations and nonprofit, in public, in private, how can leaders choose to not only have the courage and grit to confront adversity themselves, but inspire and unite their fellow teammates to do the same and work with them? Yeah, great question. So thank you for that. Um, in times of trials and tribulations, I really think you have to go back to who you are as a leader. And I've told folks often that leadership has three attributes, competence, confidence, and compassion. So when you are thinking about who you are as a leader, you've got to get your inner strength together. So I think it was, or it is, the transportation industry's mantra in the safety manual, they always tell you, put your mask on first in case of an emergency before you try to help anyone else. So I think recognizing that you have the capability to lead out of the crisis, to, and you don't have to have all the answers, but you have to be the stabilizing force. So that comes from your inner strength you've got to determine where you are in the crisis. Remember the hurricane is going on around you and around all of your colleagues. So you've got to be the anchor at the center and understand where you stand. Once you understand where you stand and have solid footing, then you must share not only where you stand, but why you stand there, why you are convinced that this is the right place for you and the organization or your classmates or your family, whatever entity we're talking about, why you're standing in that place. And once you have convinced them, you must convey that message over yes. and over and over. Because people, it usually takes folks hearing something three times before they can internalize it, process it, and act on it. So you can't get tired of sharing the message that I'm going to stand here and we are all going to turn left in five minutes. You have to say that over and over and over. So from my political days, what we would call that is staying on message. Okay, you got to determine what the message is and then stay on message and say it as many times as you need to, to get folks comfortable and get people uh aligned with where you're trying to go. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we got a question from Sarah. Yeah. Sarah says, I would like to think and hope that today's crisis is the time to recalibrate, to, think, to rethink the lives that we lived and think about the world we want to go back to. This is a very broad question, but how do you hope that we can recalibrate? How do you see organizations changing, hopefully for the better, after COVID-19? That's a great question too, so thank you, Sarah. Um, it is a broad question, but here's what I would encourage us to think about. I'm not sure we want to go back to the way the world was yesterday or two months ago being the yesterday. I said at the top of the conversation before we began the session officially that when I look outside my window, and I'm in Atlanta right now, the streets are empty, there's no pollution, the sky is blue, the birds are singing, I read that the dolphins are swimming in the canals in Venice, which they haven't done in a very long time. It's quiet in Atlanta, and I'm not mad about that, right? So Mother Nature has had an opportunity to take a collective breath 
and connect, collect herself and say, okay, these humans have imposed on me, but they're giving me a break. So I'm not so sure we need to go back to driving our cars, everybody in an individual car, polluting the air and killing the planet. I'm not sure we need to do that. So I think that we are talking about a new normal. If we're going to recalibrate, I think you look at the situation and figure out how do you make it better. I read yesterday that the Twitter CEO said, Twitter folks don't ever have to come back to the office. They have figured out that remote working, remote learning, remote interaction actually can work. Now that's not true for every industry and every sector, but where it is true, we can redistribute some of the pressure that we were putting on the earth and on ourselves. So my hope is that all of the structural issues that have been revealed in our lives, whether it's the healthcare crisis and the underserved, whether it's income inequality, whether it's gender discrimination, why can't we just stop and take a breath and rethink all of it? This is an opportunity to do that. I've never had so much time to sit and think strategically about my own personal life, let alone my professional life. Sidebar, I've been working on several things in Q1. I actually set Q1 goals and they went like this. I wanted to finish my mother's estate. She passed 18 months ago. I'm her executrix. I wanted to file my taxes. I wanted to refinance my house. I got them all done in Q1. I promise you, thank you, Sanya. I promise you guys, if I had been working all of those things, I probably would have gotten my taxes done because there's a deadline that the Fed set, but my mom's estate and my refinance would have taken me probably a year because I would have been so focused on work and the rat race and flying here and flying there and talking to my clients and I would have put my stuff on the back burner and it wouldn't have gotten done. All right, let me just talk about my house. Refinancing my house helped me cut my mortgage payment in half because the rates are so low now. There is a real financial benefit to me refinancing the house. I didn't just do it just for fun. There was a real reason for me to do it. So you would think I'd be motivated by the money. I wasn't. Typically, I'm so motivated by trying to make the world a better place that I work on the professional stuff instead of my personal stuff. Go back to what I said in the first answer. Put your mask on first. When I'm stable, I'm a better consultant to my clients. I'm a better speaker for San Yen. I'm a better mother to my son. You get the picture, right? So recalibration says not just go back to tomorrow. Let's clear the picture up and make it an even clearer, crisper, more compelling picture for tomorrow than it is today. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, this is a question from Sam. What was your favorite thing about being the president of WNBA? And what was the most valuable lesson you learned so, so far there? What are some biggest uh, challenges? No questions. Okay. So the most fun thing about the WNBA is getting to know the players. There are 12 teams, 12 women on every team. They are some of the smartest people I have ever met. It is the only professional sport where you are required to have four years post high school before you are eligible to be drafted. So all of those women are highly educated and they play six months in the US and six months in the international market. So they are citizens of the world. They are global travelers. They navigate countries and currencies and continents whereas most Americans never even navigate their home country at all. So that was my favorite thing. One of the greatest challenges was overcoming the sexism of women's professional sports. I often heard, unfortunately, young men say, oh, I could take these women one-on-one. -on -one. 
and play horse and I could beat them. I'm like, really? You think you got it like that? Come on, let me show you something. So overcoming bias that's deeply entrenched culturally was probably the hardest thing to do. But we had some successes. And things like being on ESPN since the league started in 1996, getting on more time, appointed times is what I ultimately wanted, like every Tuesday at seven o'clock, because you train your fan base. If you think about the NBA, and let me not even say the NBA, the NFL, they've done it the best in football. On Friday night, you have high school football, Friday night lights, on Saturday, you have college, and on Sunday, you got the NFL, Big Papa. But then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you got NFL as well. So it is deeply entrenched in our psyche, and people know when to tune in. So that's the greatest challenge, is building the fan base and training them. The thing that I will always remember, and I, this is just the kid in me, the coolest thing is having your signature on the ball. There's only so many people in this world who can say that their name is on a basketball. Our fellow alum, Adam Silver, who's the commissioner of the NBA can say it. David Stern before him, who was commissioner for 30 years can say it. The three women before me can say it, I can say it. And then my successor, commissioner Kathy Engelberg can say it. So most people look at the US Senate and say, oh, that's a small club, there's only a hundred people. In the president of the United States, there are 45 people. President of the WNBA, there are five people. So that was the most fun thing, is having my signature on the ball. It's sort of historic, you know? That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we got a question from Sanye. Can oh. you share a personal obstacle, obstacle in your life, a failure that helped you become so awesome and even better? Oh, Sanyan, thank you for that question. So the biggest failure that most people can read about me, it's on the internet, is my not winning the mayor's race in Atlanta in 2009. And I was expected to win that race. Obviously, I did not win it, and I was inconsolable uh, when I didn't win. And Sanyan knows the story. I stayed in bed for three days and had a pity party. What that set me up to do, though, was to take my next role, which was president of the Coca-Cola Foundation and vice president for global community affairs at Coca-Cola. So I wore two hats at Coca-Cola, one on the private corporate side, the other on the nonprofit side. On the nonprofit side, we had a commitment at Coca-Cola to give away 1% of the company's net operating income, which was between 100 and $150 million a year, to communities around the globe. And my team and I got to decide who, was, who would be the recipients of those funds and what type of projects we would undertake. Now, what is special about that is not the size of the budget, not even how we got to do it, what was really special to me was that my maternal grandparents both worked at the Coca-Cola company. My grandfather on my mother's side, 30 years as a chauffeur at the Coca-Cola company from 1929 to 1959. Not an Uber driver, a chauffeur for one of the first presidents, Mr. Arthur Acklin. My grandmother worked as a maid for 15 years in the original headquarters for the Coca-Cola company. So my maternal grandparents together worked 45 years for Coca-Cola. They sent my mother and her sister to school on those salaries. So my mother and her sister were first generation college graduates. So our family, by virtue of my grandfather's work and my work, and grandmother and my, my work, moved from the chauffeur seat to the executive suite in two generations. So when I think about the failure of, being, of not being mayor, I realize that had I been mayor, I would not have been available to take that role at Coca-Cola and continue the legacy of service to Coke that my family started and that sent my mother to college. 
So in the moment, I could not see the wisdom or the benefit of that obstacle. I thought that was the biggest roadblock ever. It turned out not only not to be a roadblock, it was not even a bump in the road. It actually was a springboard to send me to something higher and even better. Awesome, thank you for sharing this story. We got a question from Anne. Okay. Um, what is the book or books that you have been given most as a gift and why? We're getting, we're really looking forward to getting back to reading and taking advantage of the free time. So what are some book <laughs> recommendations you would get for us? All right, so let me give you a couple. I somehow knew you guys would ask me that. So I brought a couple of books I wanted to show you. Okay, so. This is the first one. It's called Seeing Around Corners, and it's by Rita McGrath. She is a professor at Columbia, and Seeing Around Corners is about seeing inflection points in business. Most people think things come out of the blue, think Uber and Lyft, but what her, she argues is that many things are, when they happen, are really the result of a very long process of change that you perhaps did not notice. And if you are aware that these are potentially on the horizon, so if you could see that there were problems in the mass transit via taxi cab scenario, you would potentially have seen an opportunity for a Lyft or an Uber or some gig economy type person to enter into the picture and disrupt that industry. So I would commend this to you, not only for business, but I think beginning to think this way will actually help you in your family or in your classes or wherever. She speaks specifically about business, but the process of thinking this way, I think, would be very helpful. The second book that I would commend to you is about, and this is from a Duke graduate. She was Duke undergrad. It's called Edge, Turning Adversity into Advantage. Laura, is it Huang San Yen? Uh, and I started reading this book because I keep getting asked so many questions about diversity and about being a woman and about being African American. And I'm like, okay, I don't speak for all women and I can't speak for all black people. Let's just be clear, okay? But she argues everybody has adversity in their lives and everybody can turn that into an advantage. So when I first heard about this book, I thought, what in the world can she teach me about adversity, diversity, oh my God. Okay, that was hubris. What I would tell you is she can teach you plenty and you should read this book. Duke undergrad, I can't remember, where did she get her MBA, Sanya? She is a professor at Harvard, and both Rita and Laura are actually good friends of mine. <laughs> okay, so I want you to tell them that I'm reading their books well. and that I am commending them to my fellow Dukies uh, to read because it is just amazing. You think you know a lot about a topic until you invite someone else into your life vis-a-vis -a, -vis a book. You can read it audiobook or however, and you learn so much. Those are two I would commend to you, but the other thing I would offer is that I subscribe to something called Blinkist. Have you guys heard of this? So it's modern day Cliff Notes is what it is, Cliff's Notes, and you, the Blinkist team reads books and then they tell you what the insights are out of those books. And they tell you it's a 15 minute listen or a 20 minute read or whatever. So every time I eat a meal, I listen to a Blinkist book so I can learn something and, and I love multitasking, okay? So I'm trying to be smart and use that time wisely. I have completely binged on Netflix and movies and series. So I was like, okay, I've got to use my time more wisely. So I'm not telling you not to binge on Netflix. I'm telling you it's an easy and quick way that you can learn about lots of different topics very quickly if you don't have time to sit down and read an entire book over three days a week or whatever amount of time you have. Thank you for the recommendations. Sure. Uh, quickly jumping ahead in our question list, 
Um, a lot of people are very excited about Caroline's question, so I'm going to oh. put that first. Okay. What is your number? What is your number one piece of advice for athletes, either college or pro, who are transitioning into professional pursuits, based on experience working in the WNBA? Huh. My number one piece of advice. Um, my number one piece of advice for athletes. It's a little bit different. As I mentioned, the WNBA athletes all have four years post high school. Most of them are college graduates or have the equivalent from the international markets. Um, so I would tell people reading and listening are two of the things that most folks do not do, at least consistently. Athletes are no different. Athletes are, or let me say it this way, Sports are what athletes do. That's not who they are. People put them in a box, and that's so unfair. So I would say to you, just like I would say to an athlete, you need to read more and you need to listen more. God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. We should listen twice as much as we talk. So oftentimes, we think we have answers or we think we have perspective, and we all do. But I always invite and encourage others to share with me what they're thinking. Athletes first among equals. Oftentimes, athletes have garnered and sharpened skills that they don't even realize they have, particularly leadership skills, because they are thinking just in the box or in the sphere of sports. Much of their knowledge is fungible, meaning it is applicable in many different disciplines. So I would invite athletes not to segregate themselves off and think of, I'm just a sports person. No, you are a human being just like the rest of us. And perhaps you didn't take the same classes. That's why God made things like Blinkist and books that you can listen on audio, right? So I would say that they are no different from anyone else, that we should allow them to have the dimensions to their personality just as we have them two hours. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, got a question from Alana. Yeah. What are the biggest barriers you see to female leadership? And can you give some examples of tangible examples or steps or how to overcome these barriers as women entering the workforce as young undergraduate uh, students? Absolutely. The biggest barrier to women uh, doing well is women believing in themselves. There are a lot of issues that people perceive that we have, that people put us down, particularly men in business. And I'm not saying that that's not true, but go back to the top of this conversation when I said your foundation has to be strong. It's like the core of your body has to be strong. We as women are taught to navigate, or excuse me, we are taught to nurture. We are not often taught to navigate or negotiate. We're taught to take care of others. And I'm making very general statements here, so forgive me. I'm not trying to stereotype. I'm just saying what I've seen in my 62, soon to be 63 years of living, myself first among equals. We have to do things and do them well so that we feel comfortable knowing that we have the capability and the capacity to do these things. So what I often tell women is take a grease pencil on your bathroom mirror Write down on the left side of the mirror all the things you want to do and a date certain by when you want to do them. On the right side of your mirror with another grease pencil in another color, I usually write in black on one side and I write on red in the other. I use blue to draw pictures. Grease pencil will come off your mirror so it's not gonna hurt your mom's house or your house. On the right side, I write down all the results that I've been able to achieve. So as I'm checking off the aspirations on the left, I am creating a list on the right. So what you are in fact doing is demonstrating with tangible evidence that you have the capability and the capacity to get things done. That reinforces your confidence and your belief in yourself. So even when someone tells you no, you can go in your bathroom every morning as you're brushing your teeth and you can see that you've been able to accomplish something. That reinforces your belief in yourself. So it starts with confidence. 
for women. So the tangible proof for me would be the first time I ever asked for money when I was running for office. You have to sit in a room, they call it the call room for a reason, you have a headset on, you have to set a goal at the beginning, or you're supposed to set a goal at the beginning of the session. You do not come out of that room until you have reached that goal. I thought I could never ask for money, let alone raise $50,000 or $100,000 in a four-hour session. Trust me, it can be done. And I learned how to do it. And many people told me no. But clearly, a lot of people told me yes. You can go back and look at my filings for when I ran for office. We raised like $4 million. So it is eminently doable, but I didn't believe I could do it until I set the goal and then saw the results and I could see it on a re repetitive basis that built my confidence. I went to Grady, the hospital, and helped raise $325 million. The time frame was five years. We did it in four. So when I tell people that, and we started in 2008 and all the money came out of Atlanta, you guys might not remember this, but 2008 was the last stock market crash that we had. It was a bad time for this country. So to start raising money then was crazy, but to finish that type of campaign in 80% of the time as opposed to 100% of the time, what's that? An accomplishment, right? So I wrote it down and now if anybody says to me, can you raise money? It doesn't bother me, it doesn't scare me. I have the repetition and the demonstrated results to prove that I could do it. So thank you so much. I think we're close to um, wrapping up our conversation. We do have a couple more questions. We'll be documenting these questions. And um, thank you all for you know, participating. And thank you, Mrs. Borders, for answering those questions. And thank you for sharing your insights and experiences. Listen, it was absolutely my pleasure. I wish all of you all the best of luck. Please stay healthy and please stay safe. Devil um, Ford. I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> hand it over to Sanyin for some closing remarks. Absolutely. Just, uh, this has been wonderful. Thank you. And I learned so much. You know, as long as we've known each other, every time we speak, every time I listen to you talk, I always take away some jams that help make my life better. And I know you sharing those with this group of students, uh, you've, you've made a mark on our lives. Thank you so much, Lisa.